Hello and welcome to River Valley Online. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us at home. It's great to have you virtually with us. Just a couple announcements this morning. We want you to know that our senior Bible study uh, that happens on Thursdays is going to resume starting September 3rd at 10 a.m. That'll be socially distanced right here in the sanctuary. We're going to get back together September 3rd at 10 a.m. A couple things to support the Cornerstone of Grace. Sunday, September 13th, uh, 10.30 on the lower level. That's down by the basement doors. We're going to have a, a brat fry out there, so we want to encourage you to do that. That's going to start at 9.30 that morning, so you can choose how to adjust your Sunday schedule. Uh, and there will be a basket sale August 30th, September 6th, and September 13th. Those three Sundays you can bid on baskets uh, to support all the Cornerstone of Grace. Our indoor regathering service begins September 20th. So September 13th is the last online uh, and outdoor service. Then 20th will be online and indoor. So you can continue to worship online with us if you'd like, or if you feel more comfortable coming inside, we'll be doing that September 20th. We have a women's conference coming up in person and online September 26th, so we want to encourage you to save the date for that. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you wherever we are, whoever we're with, to lift your name high. I pray, Lord, that everything we do and say would be to your glory and honor, and that we would be led to your throne through this worship now, and that we would learn from the sermon after it that, Lord, we would not just hear these things, but we would apply them to our lives, Lord, that you would teach them to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Would you Good morning. Wherever you are, please stand and join us in worship. Oh, I've been made before, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph Oh my God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see you
thank you, Lord, that you are the lion and the lamb, that you are the most powerful God, that you are in control of every little thing in our lives. Lord, we just trust you. We trust you in this time of uncertainty, Lord. We just trust you and trust your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, over the past few years, Nancy and I have found ourselves laughing at each other over a few things that some would consider first world problems. These are those problems that come from living in a wealthy, industrialized nation. People who live in developing countries, I think it would be safe to say that they would love to have these kinds of problems. When your major problems are not being able to find the remote, or you are sick of every restaurant in town because you eat out practically every night, those are first world problems. Here are our first a few first world problems that I found on Pinterest. Too cold in the morning to go without a jacket. Too hot in the afternoon to keep it on. Annoying to carry in hand. Unfortunately, this first world problem is going to be very real all too soon. Or this one. I poured my cereal into the bowl without checking to see if we had milk. We didn't. And the worst first world problem of all, when the, coffee, when the cookie is just too big to dunk it in the milk. Today our portrait of faith is one of the great women of the Bible named Hannah. She was a woman with a real problem. Her story gives us an opportunity to see how a person of faith can deal with the real problems of life. Would you pray with me? Father, now as we open your word, I pray that each of us would give your spirit and your word the opportunity to work within us, to change us, to, to make us into the people that we are to be. And Lord, would the words that I'm about to speak and the thoughts in all of our minds and hearts be acceptable to you and only to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, there was a time early on in Israel's history that they were ruled by judges. Let's just say it wasn't one of the brightest eras in history. We've looked in depth at two of these judges already this summer. The first one was Gideon. He started slow, but once he figured out that God was with him, he could conquer his enemies. The second judge we looked at was Samson. Let's just say Samson would not make it in the Hall of Fame because of his moral, God-fearing life. But in his final days, he realized that he should have lived a life set apart for God. Today, we're going to look at Hannah the mother of Judge Samuel. In Hannah, we will see how God is aware of our problems and how we are called to deal with these problems. Let's look at Hannah's problem in 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the other was named Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man, Elkanah, used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke 
her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to, to provo- provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Hannah's problem of infertility is the focal point of her story. In Hannah, we see a woman who did not lose faith or hope in spite of the problem she faced. It's easy to think that the heroes in the Bible were somehow different than we are. We might think that it's, it's tough to relate to them because their lives were so perfect and their culture was so different from ours. Actually, the Bible is filled with people just like you and me who had real-life problems and dealt with them with real faith in quite a hostile culture. So here's Hannah's problem. In those days, the, the wife's chief role was to provide a male heir for her husband along with other children. A barren womb was considered a curse, and Hannah would have been looked down upon by everyone in her community, especially by her husband's second wife. Elkanah had a divided family, which came from his decision to marry two wives. Polygamy was not God's original intent for marriage. But it was often done when a first wife did not bear children. It's likely that Elkanah had married Hannah first, and then because she was not able to have children, societal pressure forced him to marry Penina. Though the the Bible records the polygamous relationships of of the great figures of faith, the Bible never endorses it. Even though the friction between these two wives was severe, I believe the most difficult thing that Hannah had to deal with was the phrase that is repeated twice in this section of Scripture. And the Lord had closed her womb. God is the source of Hannah's problem. God gave Hannah this problem? I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like to allow myself to go in that direction too often. Have you ever considered the possibility that some of our problems are given to us by the Lord himself? We don't really want to believe this. We'd rather blame it all on Satan, the enemy, or on someone else. But the Bible is clear that nothing happens to us, that God doesn't ordain and allow. It is God who allows good things and bad things to come into our lives. This past week, we got a call from our daughter, Katie. She was weeping bitterly over the sudden death of a a dear friend from college. I wasn't really pleased to think that God would allow a faith-filled 27-year-old man to suddenly drop dead in his yard. But repeatedly in my life, I've had to remind myself that God is in charge and I am not. While it's difficult, we need to echo Job's faith. He lost everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his children, and in the end, he lost his health. Yet still, he could say, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And a scripture that was new to me this week with the same theme from Ecclesiastes 7. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other. Why would God allow hardship to come our way? 
Why would God allow a 27-year-old to die on the spot? Why would God allow a spouse of one uh, would allow a spouse of one of his children to cheat? Why would God allow a vibrant Christian university's reputation to be tarnished by yet another sex scandal? A very wise professor back in 1980 told me his philosophy of life. He said, Dave, God puts us on this planet to learn something. The circumstances of your life will teach you what God wants you to learn. I didn't realize it then, but Dr. Tufty was putting in his own words, James chapter 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So here we have Hannah, a woman of faith facing trouble, facing a real-life problem that God had allowed to be in her life. She was barren, and to make it worse, a family member was rubbing it in. Panina couldn't just be thankful that she had children. But she felt she needed to harass Hannah. Can you relate to something like that, to that kind of anguish? It's not bad enough that you have a, a problem that you cannot solve. It's not enough that this problem has caused you spiritual distress and made you a societal outcast. On top of all that, you have a bully in your life who tries to provoke you every time you are together. Hannah had a real-life problem. Followers of Jesus, we're not guaranteed a problem-free, care-free life. Paul wanted to re remind his readers that he was having problems and they should expect nothing different. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, We think you ought to know, Paul writes, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. While some of our problems are just the result of our poor choices, or the result of living in a sin-infested, icky world. Some of our problems are gifts from God. God allows them in our lives to learn how to rely on Him and not ourselves. People of faith will have problems in their lives, but they face them differently than the world around them does. The principle that Hannah added to her faith foundation and the principle that I believe we can add to our faith foundation is this. God sees and is very aware of our problems. As we've been saying all summer, faith comes with a call. So God called Hannah to do something about her problems, and he's calling us to do the same. In the midst of our problems, our first response must be to keep praying. Hannah had a heartbreaking problem. But she didn't shut down or lash out at those around her. She didn't blame God, but she didn't keep her emotions bottled up and withhold them from God. She wept and she blubbered, but the whole time she expressed her faith through her prayers. Our problems should drive us to prayer. Look at Hannah. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, 
Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Her weeping was mingled with her prayers. Hannah's broken, but her brokenness led her to pray. I don't believe that we really fully comprehend the power of prayer. Over and over, from Genesis to Revelation, we read story after story of people just like you and me, who when faced with incredible challenges, faced with incredible challenges in life, what did they do? They prayed. And God heard those prayers, and he responded. Sometimes he gave them what they asked for. Sometimes he said no. Sometimes he said, wait. And still, other times, he gave them way more than they ever asked for. But in God's response to every prayer, the most important lesson that they needed to learn was to be utterly dependent on him. Hannah's desperate prayer shows us just how much she was depending on God. Did you catch to whom Hannah is addressing her prayer? She starts, O Lord of heaven's armies, O Lord Almighty, O Lord of hosts, some translations say. We fly over those names like nobody's business. But what do those descriptions of God really mean? As Hannah's praying here, she is calling on the leader of the armies of heaven. She knows that the Lord Almighty had all the soldiers of heaven standing at attention, ready to do his bidding. Hannah is appealing to God's absolute power and authority she knows that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that she can do. So she is appealing to the creator of the universe to solve her problem. I wonder, do we always acknowledge that the hearer of our prayers is the leader of the greatest and most powerful army in not only on earth, but in the entire universe? Do we realize that if we pray according to his plan, according to his will, will he will release that army on our behalf in response to our praise? Simply amazing. Did you also notice that Hannah's prayer included a vow? a commitment. As part of her prayer, she is making a vow that if she's given a son, he will be dedicated to the Lord for his entire life. Her son would become a priest and serve in the temple. I'm going to skip a few verses here. What, what follows as we continue through chapter 1 are a few verses that basically show that even people who work for uh, God professionally, a.k.a. priests and pastors, can say some pretty stupid things and still be used by God. You can read that on your own. So let's skip quickly over that to verse 17. Then Eli, the, he was the uh, not-so-effective priest, he said, "'Go in peace.'" May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back again and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. 
In this instance, Hannah had gotten the answer that she wanted. But what happens? What happens when we don't get the answer that we want? We pray for a lot of things. Some good, some, some bad, some really <laughs> pointless. We need to always keep in mind that prayer is not our way of getting God to do what we want him to do. Our prayers should call for God's will to be done. Sometimes, though, there's a conflict between our will and God's will. So how do we respond when God says no? Many people listening to this message have had God say no to them. People praying for someone to spend their lives with. People praying that their children or their spouse would repent and come to the Lord. People praying that somehow those finances would just come together. In a story from Jesus' life, Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to heal their dying brother. Yet Jesus allowed Lazarus to die. Why did he say no to these grieving women who loved him so much? Because he had greater things planned for Lazarus. Things that no one could possibly have imagined. No is one of the hardest answers that we can receive. But once again, it's important to remember that God is all-knowing. God is aware of the entire timeline of history. He knows every possible outcome of every possible choice in every possible situation. We do not. He sees the big picture. We do not. When we get a no answer, we must trust that whatever we ask for was not God's will. I know that there are women and men at River Valley who prayed fervently, yet they still have not been able to achieve a successful pregnancy. I know that there are people praying for healing for a loved one. I know that there have been teens that have prayed that God would give them that part in a play or, or that position on a team. And God says no. That is when we must practice Psalm 46. Be patient and know that he is your loving father. When we pray, we must be prepared to accept God's wisdom and not our own, whether or not we agree with his answer. Our response to these no situations must be, okay, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this situation? So let's finish up the story. Go to verse 24. When the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. After sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord. And he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And he worshiped the Lord there. One small rabbit trail here. While we should not make deals with God, a vow of action can show our commitment to our prayer. In a crisis, many people can make flippant promises to God only to forget them once the problem passes. Not so with Hannah. She fully intended to keep her promises, and I believe God knew that. 
What a selfless gift from Hannah to the Lord. And as a result of her giving up this firstborn son and being true to her word, we find out later that the Lord blessed Hannah and Elkanah with five more children. And Hannah's first child, Samuel, would go on to become one of the good judges of this period who would commit himself to teaching Israel, as the Bible says, the good and right way. What follows in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel is a long outburst of praise from Hannah. Please take some time and read this chapter this week. This is a wonderful glimpse, a wonderful glimpse into the heart of a woman of faith. She saw the power of God at work in her life. In spite of the years of barrenness and the, the verbal abuse of Panina, she praises God for hearing her prayer in the midst of her sorrow and pain. When we have trouble, when we have pain and heartache, don't we just want people to understand what we're going through? We're never going to find the perfect person with the perfect understanding of our situation. But we will find perfect understanding from Jesus Christ as we converse with him in prayer. As the words of the hymn say, can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Over and over in the Bible, God reminds us that he sees our problems. And he calls us to bring those problems to him in prayer. Psalm 55, give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. The question now is, will we listen to this call? Will we allow God to help us? Will we allow him to give us comfort, peace, Rest for our minds and hearts? I hope so. Would you pray with me? Father, would you empower us to, to bring our problems to you? To pray without ceasing, as Paul said. And Lord, above all, in our prayers, would we, Lord, not inflict our will on yours, but be seeking your will for us. Lord, you are powerful. You are the commander of heaven's armies. And Lord, you could grant every request that could ever come into our mind, but some of those requests are not from you. So Lord, help us to know. Help us to pray for your will to be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, wherever you find yourself today, while you're watching this, I, I hope you know that God is with you. God is above you, watching over you, protecting you. God is beside you being your friend. A friend that you can approach through your prayers. A friend that you can have a conversation with about your problems. And a friend that will also show you the way he wants you to go in those prayers. And he'll give us encouragement and pick us up when we fall. But this friend, this friend goes right here giving us peace. As we commune with him in our prayers, God gives us peace. Peace that the world doesn't understand. But peace that the world needs and it's our job to let the, know, the world know that this peace is available to them. So let's do that today. Amen? God bless you all.